Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hope Discovered podcast by ComQuest. My name is Bill. If you have never heard our program before, what we do here is share stories of hope. And oftentimes this is in regard to recovery from mental illness or addiction or any kind of trauma, really. And uh, we we hope to uh, bring some inspiration and let you know that recovery is possible. Our guest today is Jeff Daffler. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Bill. Awesome. Jeff is a recovering alcoholic and an AA member participating in weekly meetings and speaking regularly to patients at a detox facility near his home in Ohio. He is on the board here at Conquest and active in his UCC congregation. He is the founder of the Daffler Company, a strategy, public policy, and communication consulting firm, and an adjunct professor of communication at Walsh University. Jeff is also the author of a new book, Sobriety, A Journey of Recovery Through the Psalms. And we should probably point out that when you see the book, sobriety has a P before it, very much like the word psalms. He is here today to share his journey of recovery and, like I said, provide hope and inspiration. So, Jeff, let's kind of start with the uh, very beginning. Are you originally from this area? No, I'm not. Uh, uh, thanks for having me here, first sure. of all. But but I hail from uh, the Dayton area. Dayton, okay. Yeah, yeah, I grew up in a small town called New Lebanon, Ohio, which is uh, partway between Dayton and the Indiana border. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, just a small town. In about uh, 3,000, 4,000 people. And uh, yeah, so I grew up there. I moved to the area in 2005. Great, great. Well, we're very glad that you're here. Um, talking about your early days, childhood and things like that, uh, what kind of a kid were you? Were you a sports kid or? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was into sports. Being from a, a small town like that, yeah. um, basically, if you have an interest, uh, you're on the team. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of, the, one of the most challenging things for me to uh, get used to moving to this area with yeah. much larger school systems. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the requirement, you know, you need to specialize in a sport almost out yeah. of the gate in order to uh, have a hope of making the varsity team. Yeah. But if you were uh, breathing yeah. uh, and willing, <laughs> That's uh, you were on the team. Uh, so I know exactly what you mean. I uh, I went to McKinley and I, I played football through my grade school years. And by the time I got to high school age, I, it was starting to get to the point where I was afraid of the quarterback. <laughs> so <laughs> I decided that was not going to be my future. Yeah, my, my football experience. So my freshman year, uh, there was a separate freshman team uh, at my my school and uh, I uh, played running back on offense. I was a linebacker on defense. Um, I snapped for the punts. I uh, returned punts. Yeah. I was the place kicker and, and ki- <laughs> I never came off the field the entire. Well. <laughs> and that wasn't because I was an exceptional football player. <laughs> that was just because I think I was dumb enough to uh, be willing to do all those things. Yeah, that's great. What was your uh, family like? Like, did you have a lot of brothers and sisters or? Yeah, it was, so my family is uh, my, my mom and dad and my younger brother and me. Mm-hmm. Um, my brother's four and a half years younger. So it was one of those situations where um, there was enough distance between us that we weren't terribly competitive yeah. with one another. We were into different things, but, uh, but it was also, uh, you know, for me being the older brother, you know, the little brother always wanted to tag along and yeah. I probably could have done a better job, but you know, uh, that's, it's, uh, it's, it's tough when you're a kid. Sure. Moving into, um, your journey, your, your, your story. Um, how did you get introduced to alcohol? Well, I, I think I had my first, what I would say, real drink, um, when I was in junior high and that was something that was, uh, I don't know, it was an eye opener for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I was, when I was a kid growing up, it was one of those situations where, I, I always felt like I was on the outside looking in. I mm-hmm. didn't feel like I was part of the in crowd or accepted. And, 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 and I also had a lot of pressure, um, 
it, I, I felt pressure to succeed and um, and and you know had kind of fear of falling short and 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 those kind of things uh, when, it, when even when I was a kid and and so that creates stress it creates anxiety and um, you know I w- when I had that first drink and it sort of sunk in. Mm-hmm. I felt that kind of warm glow and 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 a relaxation and those problems didn't quite seem so heavy or or bad as they were mm-hmm. before and I thought oh this is good stuff and mm-hmm. um and 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 that's that's kind of my first exposure so then going into high school um, and, and certainly uh, carrying into college, uh, I really turned into a bit of a binge drinker, Yeah. Um, which was a clear indication that once I started, I didn't have that switch that went off like some people do yeah. um, that says, OK, that's enough. You probably ought to stop. Yeah. Um, I remember back in high school. Um, my friends and I would have these campouts on Friday or Saturday night, and they were nothing but an excuse to drink as much beer as we could until yeah. we puked, and then drink some more. Um, yeah. And and yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how I got my start with alcohol. Yeah. So how did it progress then? Obviously, it it, it became a problem. Uh, it started to uh, derail a lot of things that were going on in your life. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it certainly did that, um, but not till many years later. Uh, interestingly, uh, there uh, you know there are long stretches in my life, my adult life, when I either didn't drink at all or very rarely. Okay, and and I think as I kind of moved out into life, and especially as I was moving forward with a career, uh, there there were still things I'm talking in my twenties and thirties yeah. that were more important to me than drinking. And interesting. And, and, yeah. and so I, I there must have been even a recognition of the of the problem mm-hmm. somewhere in my subconscious to sort of say, don't do this because you've got to focus on these other things. Um, I don't know that I consciously looked at it that way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I was so, again, uh, long stretches uh, when I when I didn't drink. But, you know, I so I had a, I had a job that that took me overseas a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, once I left that and moved back to the United States uh, permanently, mm-hmm. um, I sort of, I gradually started drinking on a much more regular basis. Okay. Started innocently enough. Um, you know, I, I, I find all these ways to justify things to myself. Sure. Um, and, and I read an article about how uh, red wine is good for your heart. And my father had had heart issues and had a, a stent put in. And so I thought, you know, I have to pay attention to these things. So maybe it would be good if I had, you know, a glass of wine in the evenings. And so that was a glass and yeah. then it was two glasses. And, and, and very quickly that became frustrating, Mm -hmm. not satisfying to me. Um, But I I didn't feel comfortable, um, especially in my family situation, going beyond that. So I found myself finding ways to drink secretly Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and, and, and drinking and hiding it. At least I thought it was hiding it. Right. Yeah. And and, and that went on, I would sort of say, in a gradual way for several years. And, 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 and eventually I would, you know, one glass became two and two became three. And then a bottle became a bottle and a half. And, and, and then I started drinking other things. And, and especially when I, when I got into hard liquor, um, I was able to, um, if it's, it's amazing the things that I would go through to try to keep, keep, other people, I thought, yeah. clueless as to what was going on. Sure. Right. And and so I, I, I re- remember having um, whiskey in my house and I would I would drink it when no one was around. But as the bottle started to get down to a certain point, I think, oh, this is going to be noticeable that yeah. this is disappearing faster than it should Normally. be. Yeah. I better get another bottle 
swap them out and and so all of the all of the lying all of the deception and and uh yeah. and mental energy expended on all of that is incredible yeah. it sounds to me though and correct me if i'm wrong that this kind of crept up on you a lot of times uh, some of these stories uh when people have their first drink it, it's instantly out of control uh but but in in your case I, i'm almost going to say it was a, a little harder to notice because you didn't have an instant reaction it just sort of the water just sort of gradually came to a boil with you sitting in it um and and uh I, do you want to speak about that is that true or yeah i i think that's true um I, I think that um, again, it was it was one of those situations in which the, two things were at play. One, I you know I don't so the the Pink Floyd song "Comfortably Numb" yeah was kind of my anthem. Sure, and that's what I wanted to be. <laughs> yeah, I wanted you know to take away the stress and the anxiety I felt from job, from family, from just life in general. That. A lot of people can deal with yeah. just fine, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I couldn't, I thought, without drinking. Yeah. And so I just wanted to hit this kind of mellow place yeah. where I was chilled out and I wasn't bothered by these things that were always inside mm -hmm. kind of bubbling and, and boiling, kind sure. of uh, tearing me apart. Um, the, the, the challenge with it was that I had to drink more and more to get to that place. Yeah. And the time I spent in that place got smaller and smaller. Yeah. Because I'd, I'd, I'd drink till I got there and then very quickly overshoot it. Yeah. And, and, and then I kind of ended up with this cycle of, um, you know, feeling things I didn't want to feel drinking to try to make those feelings go away, mm -hmm. getting drunk and, behaving and, and talking to people in a way that actually made my situation worse. Sure. Lying about what was going on. And then the next morning thinking, how am I going to keep this straight? What do I have to cover? Mm -hmm. And and then the negative feelings just skyrocketing as a result. And so therefore drinking more yeah. and and kind of so so that was the cycle that uh, that I was on that eventually led me to drink daily, sure. um, increasingly, uh, you know, at first it was just in the evenings. Uh, then it was the, you know, that evening got, yeah. it was the whole evening. Then it was, well, I better have some over lunch. Yes. Um, and then it got to the point where, you know, waking up in the morning, I needed something to get me going. Sure. Sure. As your tolerance, it sounds to me like, uh, as your tolerance, uh, became greater, uh, you know, the, uh, patterns of, of more alcohol started to develop, a uh, you know, a cycle within your system that yeah. told you that you needed it. Um, you know, you talked about, uh, feeling that you were in control of it there for a while, uh, you know, disguising the bottles and so forth. At some point though, um, something started to happen. Something had to happen where you started to realize uh, this is out of control now. Uh, what was the tipping point for you? Well, you know, I, it's, it's funny because I went back, um, after I got sober and I, I've, I've always kept journals all the way back to high school. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and even throughout, you know, when my drinking was getting worse and worse, I kept these journals and, and I would make cryptic annotations to myself, on an almost daily basis, things like uh, did pretty well last night or um, completely missed the target last night because yeah. I would set what I believed was an acceptable number of drinks to have. Sure. And 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 then comment on it the next day, whether or not that's not that's not normal drinking behavior. Right. right. And 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 so it was clear to me that I had a challenge. I had a problem. Uh huh. Um, but that problem just kept getting worse. I finally stopped writing about it altogether. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and it started to affect every aspect of my life. Yeah. Um, it affected, you know, my relationships with people closest to me. Um, it 
ultimately I, I had sworn that it would never affect my work. You know, I was yeah. a bit of a workaholic sure. as well and um, was determined that, you know, that I would I would never allow my drinking to affect my work. But eventually it did. Yeah. Uh, eventually I lost my job. Um, I had uh, an OVI and ended up with legal problems as a result of that. Yeah. Um, I was in financial difficulty. I I had destroyed relationships in my life and was frequently hurting the people that I cared most about. Sure, sure. And and I became soul sick to the point where in this was November of 2017. Mm-hmm. I, I just I reached a point where I just quite honestly didn't want to live anymore. Wow. Um, you know, I, at that point, I didn't I had moved to a point where I declared myself agnostic and didn't have what I would call a relationship with a higher power yeah. in any kind of spiritual practice. And and. Even then, sometimes I did pray to a, a God I didn't really believe in. And the only prayer that I said back then was, just don't let me wake up in the morning. Wow. Um, so I, I was reaching that point of desperation. Yeah. And near hopelessness. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, either I got help and got sober or, or I don't think I'd be here today. Wow. Yeah. How did you reach out for help? What were your first steps? Well, interestingly, uh, because of some trouble that I, I ran into, um, I, I, I decided I'd, I'd give, uh, a 12 step meeting a try. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to a couple of AA meetings, um, Ironically, uh, it was sort of the connection to uh, you know, the fact that, you know, there was a prayer, um, the fact that there was reference to God or a higher power at the meetings that kind of turned me off. Um, and 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 so I, I only made it to two meetings. I quit drinking for 15 days. And mm -hmm. and this was, you know, probably four or five months prior to when I actually yeah. ended up <laughs> trying again. Right. Um, made it for 15 days without a drink and told myself it's there's no way I can be an alcoholic if I can go for two weeks without a drink. Yeah. So I tried to ease back into it. Um, the easing lasted a night or two. Yeah. And then I was right back where I had started. Sure. Um, but when I had gone to those meetings, uh, a man that I actually knew from outside, um, came up to me, welcomed me, talked to me, and he bought me a, a, a big book. Yeah. And um, I read it. I read some of it mm -hmm. back then when I got it. Um, but I put it down. I figured, look, I can handle this. Mm -hmm. I can do this um, on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, I can manage this problem. And, uh, and so I set it aside and didn't give it any more thought. Well, on a particular night in a deep state of desperation and darkness, mm -hmm. I really was sitting there thinking, do I want to go on? Yeah. And I, I remembered that book. Mm -hmm. And I had stopped reading at the chapter that is entitled We Agnostics. And, and I didn't really want to read that because I had had my rounds with sure. religion over many years of my life. And, and, and I thought, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to think about this, but I opened it up and I went back to that chapter and mm -hmm. I started reading. And honestly, it was as if it was a personal letter written to just me. Yeah. And I could see as I read those words mm -hmm. that by rejecting the possibility of, of a God or, or of a higher power, mm -hmm. what I had really done 
is put myself in in that role. Mm-hmm. I thought I could call all the shots. I thought I was in charge. Mm-hmm. I thought I could meet any challenge. Yeah. And as I read that night, <laughs> it was obvious to me how that worked out. Mm-hmm. Not very well. Yeah. And I got down on my knees and I prayed a simple prayer. The only prayer that I could utter at that moment, which was God, please help me. Yeah. And the next night um, I went to an AA meeting and by the grace of God, I haven't had to take a drink since. That's, uh, you know, listening to you tell that story, I, I can feel the, uh, the emotion and the power that that moment had for you. Um, and in reading some of your background, uh, I, I believe it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the AA program, you have, one of the things you have to do is you kind of have to admit that you are powerless and, uh, you have to admit that you have a, I guess, a weakness in the face of addiction and uh, a higher power sometimes is what you have to surrender to, um, so that's kind of how those pieces came together for you. I, I guess with the Psalms, um, how did the Psalms kind of stand out as useful tools in particular? Yeah, well, as, as I mentioned, I had a I have a bit of a long history with uh, with religion and faith and, and spirituality. Um, I would say when I was around um, 10, 11 years old, um, my father felt the call to the ministry. Okay, and he actually became an interim pastor uh, in the United Church of Christ. Okay, and and so he would he would serve as a as a as a pastor for churches that were between ministers, and oftentimes my my mom and my brother would go to our regular church, yeah. and I would ride along with my dad um, to wherever he happened to be preaching. And, and he, man, he put me to work, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, whatever needed doing, yeah. you know, whether it was lighting the candles or handing out the bulletins uh-huh. or reading the scripture. I was, I was his sidekick. Okay. Um, and, and as, as part of that family environment, uh, faith and spirituality were very important. And so I had exposure at an early age, uh, to, um, to, to probably, more on that front than most people would have. Now, for time, it's something that I rebelled against. Sure. Um, I, I, you know, even as an adult, I had tons of reading on theology and spirituality and the mm-hmm. history of different religions. And, and you know, I, I told myself, I've got to figure this out yeah. as if my understanding was, uh, was the most important thing. Right. Um, Looking back on it now, I realize a lot of what I was doing was just trying to prove somebody else wrong. Right, right. But through all of that, from an early age, I was drawn to the Psalms. I'm a lover of poetry. Mm-hmm. And essentially, the Psalms are poems. Okay. Um, they're prayers written as poetry. Uh, oftentimes they were, you know, put to music of some sort um, mm-hmm. that were written by ancient Hebrews. And they resonated with me throughout my life, even when mm-hmm. I was, you know, far away from any attachment or what I would call strong relationship to mm-hmm. uh, to God or um, whether I was going to church or not going to church, any of right. that sort of thing. And so when I when I got sober and accepted that, hey, you know, this is going to be a spiritual program. I've yeah. tried I've tried everything else and it didn't work. I'm trying this. OK. And if it's a spiritual program, I'm I'm going to give it a go. Mm-hmm. And 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 so I I went back to what was familiar. Mm-hmm. I went back to what I knew and loved before. And so I opened the Psalms and and I. You know, the idea occurred to me that, you know, I was I was trying to build a daily spiritual practice um, that involved reading 12 step literature and involved prayer and meditation. And I decided to make sure that every day, every morning as part of that, I would read one psalm. And I started with Psalm one and there are 150 psalms. And so by the end of it, um, I'd read a psalm a day for five months and I hadn't had a drink in five months. And um 
I was amazed at the different perspective that I had, hmm. the, the the different way in which the Psalms spoke to me in recovery than they ever had before. Wow. You know, one of the beautiful things of of about those poems is that they cover the full span of human emotion. Sure. They can be raw in their honesty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's one of the things that I could identify with. Yeah. I could see the pain. I could see the loss. Mm -hmm. But I could also see the hope. I could see the desire for refuge and a power greater than myself. Mm -hmm. um, I could see all of that shared um, in the Psalms. And, and, and many of them have they, they tell a story. They tell a story of of either an individual or a community that in some way fell on hard times mm -hmm. or had, you know, um, fallen short. Mm -hmm. uh, they turn to God for help and deliverance. Yeah. They received it and they rejoiced. Mm -hmm. And. That's that's what I wanted to happen in my life. Yeah. And so in a sense, they became, uh, you know, a source of, of spiritual growth and development for me. Great. That leads perfectly in, into my next question was, how did you incorporate uh, the message about the Psalms into tools in your book? How did that how, how what was it? What is it about your book that helps that translation work well in 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 the book so you know it's you know at the same time that i was having that experience with the psalms i was i was working the steps i was diving into um fully into a recovery program and i was learning from others in recovery from my sponsor i was learning from mm. people who shared at meetings and and i could see fascinating connections between the the psalms and what i was learning mm -hmm. as, as as a you know someone who was working the steps and and so what i try to do in uh in in the book sobriety is i try to it, it, there's a there's a reading for each of the psalms a daily reading and it's okay. set up kind of as an, a, a devotional and you know ideally you know, a, a reader would read the entire psalm that the reading is based on, but I have a couple of verses at the beginning of each reading in, in case, you know, that's not possible. Right. And 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 then in, in, in each reading, I I talk about the psalm. I weave in um, some 12 step recovery principles and, and, and thoughts and, and and some of my own story. Yeah. And um end each reading with a prayer and each prayer ends with please keep us sober today okay. because I feel for someone in recovery, there's no more important prayer than that. Yeah, sure. Very interesting. Uh, did you have something, an, an example that you wanted to, to share there? Sure. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I thought perhaps I would share the reading from Psalm 91. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and Psalm 91, I think, is a, an interesting uh, psalm for a number of, of perspectives because it gets into that poetry element a little bit. Sure. Um, and it says, you know, when we read the psalms, we must remember that we are reading prayerful songs that are written in poetic language. Poetry can be challenging for the reader because it does not present us with a factual description to be processed with our rational minds, but rather it is intended to spark an imaginative, emotional response. Psalm 91 is packed with just such beautiful images designed to help us grasp what it means when we say with the psalmist that God is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. In the verses that follow, we see pictures emerge that bring to life the truth of God's protection. All these illustrations are designed to drive home the point made in God's own words in verses 14 through 16. God will deliver, protect, rescue, honor, and save those who trust and rely on him. The imagery helps us understand that there is no evil or danger, no matter how great, that can overtake us if we rely on the one who has all power. When our security is in God, 
our understanding when the, I'm sorry, when we when our security is in the God of our understanding, then we can, as the big book says, cease fighting anything and anyone, even alcohol. And then the prayer for that day is, God, you are our refuge and fortress. What shall we fear? Please keep us sober today. That's that's great. I, I really like the daily aspect, uh, the reminders. Uh, I mean, I feel that that's that's very important. Um, besides going through your own personal journey, um, you're, you're a member of the business community. You're on the board here at ComQuest. I know you're very much in touch with a lot of the things that are happening in the community. So I just have a couple of questions in regard to that. Sure. Um, one of the things that we always try to touch on here is stigma, um, because that's a that, that's a roadblock that never really seems to go away. Um, what message about stigma uh, in regard to the people who are in the recovery uh, community and uh, a lot of times how they're treated, spoken about, regarded in the public? What message of stigma would you have? That's a great question. And, you know, I have to say that. It, it was one that I wrestled with in, in writing the book. You mm. know, um, do do I write it as an anonymous author? Mm -hmm. uh, do I identify as Jeff D or do yeah. I say, yes, this is Jeff Daffler writing this book? And ultimately, I decided in part because of my concerns about stigma uh, as an issue in our society to go ahead and and use my attach my name to the book. OK, um, I think there is a powerful message that it, that it, in recovery groups and in the Psalms, victory out of defeat, mm -hmm. strength out of weakness, yeah. hope out of despair. Mm -hmm. That's the reality of recovery as I have experienced it. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's perhaps a lack of understanding of that in the broader community. Mm -hmm. um, I think folks who don't suffer from addiction the way that I suffer from this disease mm -hmm. um, probably misunderstand um, what it's like for me, mm -hmm. what it's like for others who face this challenge yeah. and and what it means to overcome it. Yeah. Um, I think the more, and again, every individual has to make this decision for him or herself. Mm -hmm. And I fully respect um, the principle of anonymity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's important, especially for a lot of people um, who first come into recovery. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I think there's an opportunity for uh, those of us who are in recovery to share our stories in a way. Yeah. Um, that will help break down that stigma. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Another question about the community at large that I think is very relevant. I, I, I don't want to speculate as to what the future is going to be with COVID. Uh, there's a lot of variables in place here, how effective the vaccine is going to be. Are other strains going to come up? And it goes on and on. It's a problem that could be with us for a while, and we hope it's not, but it could be. In the meantime, there's a lot of people um, with varying degrees of uh, mental health issues who have been uh, more or less uh, kept at home. Right. And, you know, staring at the wall when you have a mental uh, health issue or a problem with addiction is, is never really a good thing. And uh, I know a lot of people uh, are really bracing for uh, once this starts to give a little bit uh, and people start to get back out into the community. We're going to find out that a lot of them are not going back into the community very well because of, of things that have developed during this time. Um, what is your, uh, message? What is your take on how, uh, as a society, as a, as a community, uh, we should be very empathetic to the extra stressors that COVID has put on the mental health and addiction community? Oh, we absolutely should. And it is an urgent priority for us, whether we realize it or not, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because there's a pandemic within the pandemic. That's a great way to put it. We, yeah. we we've seen, uh, substance abuse disorder uh, and, and, and sadly overdose deaths reach record levels in yeah. 2020. 
And a lot of experts make the connection between the social social isolation, the yes. job loss, the, the challenges that have been piled on top of all of us. Sure. In addition to what we normally deal with in life because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, add to that the fact that at various periods during the pandemic, access to help has been much more limited than would regularly be the case. Right. And that's true whether we're talking about uh, inpatient or outpatient treatment programs mm -hmm. or we're talking about 12-step recovery meetings. Um, even the ability to to gather in person with people that, that we love who who can offer us the support that we need as we are are trying to recover. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an urgent challenge. Um, just to those who are are either in recovery or who think they may have a problem and and, and need help, I, I would just encourage you to reach out any way that you can, even online. Mm -hmm. You know, I got much more active online and recovery groups during the pandemic than than before. I didn't even realize what was out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are 12 step meetings happening by Zoom virtually 24 hours a day all over the world. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been in uh, AA meetings with people from different continents, mm -hmm. <laughs> an experience I never would have had otherwise. Right. And so in a sense, I'm thankful for that. I've also discovered on social media, there are a number of um, uh, support groups, for example, on Twitter. I'm, I'm probably most active on Twitter compared okay. to other things. And, Great. And, and on Twitter, there's a hashtag that's called recovery posse. Oh, OK. And if you put hashtag recovery posse on your tweet and you've got a question about recovery, you've got there's a challenge that you're facing or you just want to connect with other people, mm -hmm. you, you will you will find um, all sorts of people with great sobriety replying to your message with support, encouragement and and their experience in, yeah. in dealing with some of the same issues. So, you know, this it's it's different. Yeah. But it's still good. It's still useful. And it's still a helpful way, as we've all had to deal with different ways of interacting, mm -hmm. to still find and build community. Sure, sure. That's great. There's a, there's a lot of good hashtags uh, for anyone who wants to investigate this. Uh, stigma free is one. The stigma fighters. Uh, all those things are, are, are really great things. As a uh, final word, what would be, we always end on a message of hope. What would be your message of hope to any, any person out there who may be struggling? Uh, maybe some of the early signs uh, that you were we're talking about um, drinking, for example, in secret is, is a red flag or should be to yourself that you're probably, you know, getting into a situation that you may, you may need help um, it, it, for anyone who's in that situation or a family member who's recognizing it, recognizing it. What would be your message of hope for them? My message of hope is that no matter how dark it gets, no matter how hopeless you feel, you can recover. Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen it happen in my own life and in the lives of many friends in recovery. And, it, you know, as hard as it is to admit at the beginning that we need help, mm -hmm. once we can take that step, reach out, we can begin an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. One that we maybe at the in the moment can't even dream is possible. Yeah. Uh, but a miracle absolutely can happen in each and every life. And, you know, my, my own belief and what I try to reflect in the book is that, you know, the, the God of our understanding has the power to free us from the prison of addiction. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that can be the start of a journey that leads to freedom, uh, to strength and to peace. Great. Fantastic message. Um, our guest and the author of the book is Jeff Daffler, and I'm going to say the um, the title of the book again. It's Sobriety with a Silent P in reference to the Psalms. Sobriety, a journey of recovery through the Psalms. Where can people find your book? 
Uh, it is available uh, starting March 16th, uh, but it, you can pre-order it now. Mm -hmm. uh, the The book is um, available through my publisher, uh, Westminster John Knox Press at wjkbooks.com. Okay. But it's also available on Amazon, on uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, basically any place uh, that you uh, that you buy books, uh, okay. you should be able to find it online. Uh, so. Jeff, thank you very much uh, for sharing a, a very sincere and heartfelt journey. Um, uh, this type of story is why we're here. Thank you very much. And thank you for the work that you do for Comquest as well. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, I appreciate your interest in, in my story and in the book. Awesome. Once again, uh, this has been the Hope Discovered podcast by Comquest. You can find out more about ComQuest simply by going to ComQuest.org. And once again, that's ComQuest.org. My name is Bill. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. And remember that hope happens here.